We're going to focus a little bit more on the actual pandemic right now as we transition to a student, speaking of students as well, a computer science PhD student. Robert, thank you for joining us and thank welcome you. to Sayantani to Sue if she's, yes, she's joined Hi. me. So glad to have you here today. So this is a student that we were reading about, which is impressive when you are making the university press as a student, but also um, being at the forefront of what is, of course, an extremely important topic right now, which is the modeling of COVID-19. Um, Sayantani uh, is a researcher, and I'm going to share um, just a link to her website if I can get it because I thought it was interesting as well. So you can get to know her a little bit. In addition to the work that she'll talk about of her machine learning of uh, for diseases and her recent publications, she had some fun facts too. So it turns out that she's lived around the world in multiple countries in multiple right. continents, that she is uh, uh, an expert also in different areas from poetry, karate, yoga, and swimming. So getting to know you a little bit better as an individual, nice to see your personality come through, and thank you for working on such important research this year. Tell us about your work and how machine learning will help us predict what's next for this pandemic. Thank you. Um, okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shai Anthony, and I'm a PhD student in computer science um, at UIUC. And today I will be talking about machine learning for COVID-19 mitigation. I would like to start with um, some motivation and background. Um, so first, um, about the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, uh, we've been living with this pandemic for quite some time. And by this point of time, um, we know that COVID or coronavirus disease is a, is a disease that's caused by uh, the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to worldwide infections and deaths, uh, and it has led to lockdowns and mitigation measures being implemented everywhere. This has caused disruption of our daily activities, it's increased pressure on hospitals, and it's led to economic meltdowns. To get an idea of how big or how much destruction um, this pandemic has caused uh, in terms of cases and deaths, some statistics, there have been 52 million cases worldwide and 1.28 million deaths worldwide. I would now like to br briefly talk about epidemics and pandemics. An epidemic is known as the occurrence of a disease in a widespread fashion at a given point in time that can affect se several individuals of a population. A pandemic, on the other hand, is a kind of epidemic that spreads widely over several countries and affects a significant number of people. Now, we have had several epidemics and outbreaks um, even in the past, long before COVID as well. I would like to discuss uh, some of uh, the significant ones that have happened and their nature just in the background of, um, uh, of like pandemics and uh, we will uh, go through a discussion right up to COVID-19. One of the earliest ones was the Antonine Plague uh, that was viral in nature. And um, then we had the Plague of Justinian that was bacterial in nature and caused 30 to 50 million deaths worldwide. Now, one thing I would like to point out at this point is um, that the time period of this plague was for two years. So you can imagine the amount of destruction it caused. So 30 to 50 million deaths. And then of course we had the Japanese smallpox um, that caused like 2 million deaths. Bubonic plague um, that resulted in 50 million deaths. And it also went on for quite a few number of years uh, if you look at the duration. And then we had smallpox, five to 8 million deaths that was viral in nature. We had the great plagues that was bacterial in nature and led to a total of 1 million deaths. We then had cholera, which was bacterial in nature. Now this also lasted for quite some time 
and it was worldwide and it resulted in 40 million deaths worldwide. Then coming to the third plague, which uh, was bacterial in nature and led to um, 12 million deaths worldwide. Now, the ones I, I will be talking about now are the more recent ones. So we are slowly going from the 1800s to the 1900s and ultimately to um, COVID-19. So on this chart, you will see Russian flu uh, that is a viral epidemic, was a viral epidemic, um, lasted for about a year. Um, Spanish flu uh, caused 50 million deaths in just two years. Uh, so this was also a very major, um, it was a massive scale pandemic. We then had the Asian flu, Hong Kong flu, SARS uh, or the severe acute respiratory syndrome, MERS or the Middle East respiratory syndrome, also known as camel flu. Uh, and of course, these were more like um, concentrated to certain areas, uh, but they were still, they were still pretty destructive um, in terms of deaths. Um, and of course, you also have another worldwide uh, um, and uh, even SARS also affected 17 countries worldwide. So to give an idea of the, uh, of the amount of destruction epidemics in the past have caused. And uh, now of course we have, and we are going through COVID-19, uh, we have 52 million cases worldwide, 1.28 million deaths. And um, this is viral in nature and it's spread worldwide at this point. Another thing I would like to draw attention to is that a lot of the recent um, like epidemics and disease outbreaks have been viral in nature. Uh, now, the reason of this could be something related to biology or evolution, uh, but also I would like to point out another thing that over the years, our uh, you know, medicine and medical science have progressed, but uh, we are still having pandemics and we are having to live with it. Now, a bit about um, approaches for fighting pandemics like COVID-19. There are many different ways uh, of, handling, of handling pandemics, uh, but then uh, of course, like different countries are handling pandemics in different ways. And um, here I would like to discuss some of the, the, uh, the approaches that exist. The first one is do nothing. Um, and of course, I would like to say that this is a very um, critical approach. Uh, it's, um, it, it's been criticized a lot by um, people in medicine as well as others. And it just lets people get infected. And um, eventually there's an additional burden on hospitals. And the idea is that eventually we will reach herd immunity by which people will become immune over a prolonged period of time and the disease won't spread. Um, another phenomenon that could happen is collateral damage. So even though we have COVID-19 and we have excessive hospitalizations, uh, it's important to remember that there are people uh, you know, with other types of diseases uh, who do need to like um, visit the hospital frequently and um, this, uh, this approach actually affects them as well. Uh, we then have mitigation, which is more of social distancing, flattening the curve, um, suppression is in the form of lockdowns, and this helps curb infection, curb infections and ease burden on hospitals, but it puts pressure on the people like, you know, isolation and strict stay at home orders and things like that. Um, another approach is the hammer in the dance, which has been commonly followed during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is, uh, this involves like strict lockdowns for a certain period. Um, this is known as like the hammer phase when we are trying to reduce COVID-19 infections or like um, in this approach, like the disease in general. And um, it's followed by relaxed mitigation measures and the wait for the vaccine, which is the dance. Um, and um, yeah, so the idea is that the vaccine will, uh, will then like provide, uh, like in, induce immunity in people and people can like, again, go out and lead normal lives. Um, another approach is rapid testing testing and contact tracing, which is also um, being followed during COVID-19. Uh, this involves testing populations to see if the, they have the disease and then carrying out contact tracing and isolation uh, for people who have had 
possible exposure to the disease. That also like helps control the pandemic. At the, so, so far, um, having said that, I was discussing um, pandemics in general. Now I will be discussing our approach on uh, using machine learning for COVID-19. Uh, machine learning has been a useful tool uh, for a lot of uh, approaches involving learning and prediction. And um, I would like to discuss now about why we are using machine learning. The main aim is that it helps build data-driven models to learn from data and provide predictions on unseen data. And um, the good thing about this is that um, we can apply machine learning to any sort of uh, data, even if it's like, whether it's linear, non-linear, any kind. And um, machine learning is of several forms. It could be um, supervised, unsupervised, there's reinforcement learning. And, and um, there are also like several different kinds of models. I've listed some common ones here, regression support vector machines, uh, decision trees, neural networks. Uh, but for the purpose of our talk, we will be, uh, for, for my talk, I will be focusing on our work on neural networks, specifically um, recurrent neural networks, which are uh, like a class of neural networks used for time series data. In this case, we have time series data in, uh, in terms of uh, like the cumulative cases and deaths. And um, this data is publicly available from the Johns Hopkins repository. And um, that brings me to LSTMs or long short-term memory. Um, to start off, long short-term memory uh, or LSTMs are, are like a specific type of recurrent neural network. They're capable of handling long-term dependencies, which is the reason they work. What I mean by long-term dependencies is that we want to capture what has been happening for uh, many days in the past, instead of just looking at immediate previous occurrences. Uh, so the idea is that you want um, it to remember for a long period of time. And um, this is the common structure of an LSTM. This is the one in the original, uh, proposed in the original LSTM paper by Hockreiter and Schmidhuber. Um, this is also the, we have used the same architecture for our proposed model as well. And um, so in the proposed approach, we are training LSTM model on uh, the COVID-19 cumulative cases and deaths. And we are also validating our model, of course, in the process, um, which came with its own challenges because of like the time series. So we had to take care of the training and validation splits in a time series order. And uh, we have two parameters here called the look back and the look ahead. And during the validation phase, it's um, we are focusing on how to optimize these parameters uh, to reduce like the error. Um, and what look back does is it's looking at how many days in the past should I uh, consider um, like the immediate data before making a prediction. Uh, now, of course, the training is carried out on the entire set of data. So the long term is happening there. Uh, but we also have like an, uh, like an immediate um, prediction window, which is what look back is doing. And the look ahead determines how many days in advance we want to predict. Um, so one more thing I want to mention is that our model provides insights into the effectiveness of mitigation me measures. So here we are not doing a, a race for predicting, uh, you know, what's the best, um, you know, what, what's the best uh, model or how good are we predicting test cases? That's not the goal here. Uh, the reason for that is because, um, you know, tomorrow uh, we might have like, uh, I mean, I hope this doesn't happen, but uh, we might have a huge party and there might be a huge incidence of COVID-19 cases. The model would not be able to predict that, of course, but it would be able to look at data up till today and predict, you know, what would have been the scenario tomorrow if the gathering had not happened. And um, so it kind of provides us with analytical insights in that fashion. Uh, so we, we now have like trends for how uh, the LSTM model has um, like plots on different countries. 
And um, I would like to start off with United States. Um, and um, of course, at this point, I would like to mention that this data you're seeing here is up till June 30. Um, the reason for that is because uh, we had a paper published at this point and the results are reported till here. However, in a future slide, I will be discussing uh, more recent results as well. Uh, I thought this would be interesting to provide an insight into how um, things were at um, you know, the initial stage of the pandemic. So this is trained up till like you will notice the end of May. Um, and US was at that point sort of in the beginning stages in the pandemic. Uh, there was like a huge rise in cases uh, that time and we are carrying out predictions um, sort of over the entire period of June. And um, we have similar predictions for like deaths as well. And what we can say from these graphs is we have um, in blue, we have like for all the graphs following up, we have the actual um, data that has been uh, happening. And um, we have the predicted data or like what, what our LSTM model is predicting. We also have a baseline here. The baseline um, is um, an average based on the look ahead. It's a moving average. It gives us an estimate of like uh, what, um, you know, what the average number of uh, cases and the average number of deaths are. So this is just for like qualitative uh, purposes. And um, we can draw interesting conclusions from these graphs. The first conclusion is that um, the model tends to under predict in this case. So it's predicting that, um, you know, the number of cases would have been somewhere up till here and um, the number of deaths would have been somewhere up till here. But um, in but in the actual scenario is that the number of cases and the number of deaths went above that, which basically means that the social, uh, you know, distancing and mitigation measures weren't being followed or weren't uh, enforced to that extent or people weren't really following them. Now, one more trend to observe is that COVID cases were increasing while the deaths were actually flattening at this point. And it's an interesting observation that our LSTM was also able to predict the flattening while it did show the increasing trend. But from both these graphs, we can see that the social distancing and mitigation measures, um, like more, more mitigation measure, measures would be needed in this case. So of course, um, like we know that Parts of like Europe were also affected at this point. And uh, one of the countries that we looked at was Italy. The reason we looked at Italy at this point is because uh, Italy had um, actually gone through the main phase of the pandemic right uh, around March and April. And they had seen huge hospitalizations and huge number of um, cases and deaths if you look at the graphs. And um, the interesting thing is that they had achieved a flattening by the time uh, we were analyzing their data in June. Uh, we decided to carry out carry this part of the analysis out because we wanted to see if our model was able to predict the flattening. And it turns out that it could predict um, the flattening. The only thing is that um, here you will notice that there is still a slight um, difference in between, um, like there's a slight margin in between uh, the actual and the predicted um, like um, scatter plots, which shows that certain mitigation measures might be needed, you know, before they like resume to normal life scenarios. Um, yeah, now we are, now we are focusing more on like Asian countries. And um, a lot of Asian countries have also been affected. So I would like to start off with India. And uh, the reason for that is because at this point in June, India was um, experiencing a sharp uptick in the number of cases, as well as the number of deaths. Now, one interesting thing uh, to be observed here is that um, in terms of the cases, the mitigation measures had been working pretty well as um, our model was like um, over predicted the number of predictions for cases um, as compared to the number of deaths. 
there's an interesting explanation so as to why the debts could have escalated in this manner while our predictions predicted it to be a flatter uh, curve. The reason for that is because um, there have been a lot of there had been a lot of vulnerable populations in India and uh, there was like there were extreme um, incidences of people like not getting enough hospital uh, care and things like that and that resulted in more people dying than expected. So that was also part of like mitigation measures and you know people not being careful enough um, even about like elderly people at home and not just elderly people, even people who are more vulnerable to contracting COVID-19. Another Asian country that uh, we wanted to um, draw attention to was Japan. Japan had um, an interesting curve because they experienced an uptick in cases, but then they had managed to sort of flatten or, I mean, slow down the incidence of like the rise in cases and deaths. Um, and of course, like from the graph, we can see that um, there is a wide margin between uh, the cases and the deaths, which does indicate that uh, there are more mitigation measures needed because the LSTM predictions show that we should have had a flat curve here for cases and deaths, while in reality, both cases and deaths um, went, um, you know, with a slight increase um, in, in both cases. Now, you must be wondering what, what was going on in Hubei, China. Hubei, China was the original place uh, where one of the first cases of COVID-19 had been recorded as early as December 2019. And um, the interesting thing is that by the time June happened, um, a lot of their um, predictions, like a lot of their um, cases had been stabilized. Now, uh, one thing is, uh, one thing to be noted here is that even though they had stabilized here, there is a certain margin when it comes to the number of deaths. Um, now, of course, like you're not being able to see the actual because um, it's coincided with the baseline. Uh, but yeah, there is a there is a considerable margin between the actual and the predicted in this case. And um, one reason possibly for that is because of this jump here in the number of deaths. Now, one more thing I would like to bring up at this point is um, that um, you know this is largely dependent on data, of course, and we are making the predictions on the basis of past data. Now, to look at a bit of the current trends, um, what's happening in United States now? So right now we are again seeing another uptick in cases, and of course, um, you would be uh, interested to note that we are actually doing well in terms of. Um, in terms of the, the the predictions, but in terms of debts, there's still a bit of a margin to be achieved here. Um, and um, yeah, so you would also be curious about what's going on in Champaign at this point. And um, so right now we are seeing uh, an uptick in cases on campus, uh, both uh, for cases and debts. And um, even though we are seeing like an increasing trend here, um, you know, the mitigation is actually working, but um, for debts, again, we can justify, um, you know, this large margin over here based on the vulnerable populations that do exist as part of the Champagne community. So here, uh, these, both of these graphs are incorporating not just UIUC, but also the, the surrounding community. Um, it, it captures both of them. Now, a bit of discussion about the effectiveness of mitigation measures. So what we did is now we would like to compare the different trends among counties in the United States and see how well are they doing in terms of mitigation measures. And what we did is we fixed LSTM look ahead parameters for one and five. This was just based on experimentation and um, we then like observed the number of common days and we plotted uh, the, them as a scatter plot. 
and um, then fitted the line of best fit in both cases. And um, this example here, of course, is for Cook, Illinois, but this analysis was done for like all the counties that we considered. Now, one interesting thing is when we look at the line of best fit, we can draw several conclusions. The slope gives us an indication of the rates of infections or deaths, like if, it's, if the trend is rising or decreasing in a quantitative manner. The intercept gives us an approximation of the increase or decrease in the rate of um, infections or deaths. And of course, this is a number. And um, the root mean square error in this case, or the RMSE, gives us an estimation of the stabilization rate. This is what the chart looks like for up till June 30. Um, and you will notice that all counties require mitigation measures in some form uh, based on infections and deaths. And um, so this is a comparative chart. Uh, we can compare like, for example, Cook, Illinois and Champaign, Illinois both show an increase in the number of cases. But of course, because this is more thickly populated, so we can say that there is an average of like 160 people getting infected, whereas that rate is a lot lower in Champaign. Um, but in terms of deaths, both are doing, are showing an inc uh, like a decreasing trend. Now, uh, you, uh, now, now you would be wondering what's happening as of today. So like as of recent times, um, now this is like as of October 30, right now, Los Angeles, California seems to be showing like a decreasing trend. But of course, if you compare something like Cook, Illinois and Champaign, Illinois, for example, we notice that right now the incidence of cases on campus has gone up a lot we have the probability of like approximately 60, like 62 people like getting uh, infected, um, you know, on average over the period of time that we were looking at. At this point, I would like to uh, talk about like the references and, um, and um, so this is uh, the, the work that I described so far was um, from our recently published paper and also a lot of it has been uh, derived from my MS thesis. And before I end my talk, I would like to thank my advisor, Professor Roy Campbell for his guidance. And I'm also thankful to Jump Arches for having funded our work and for their financial support. Thank you for listening to my talk. Thank you for all the information. And I'd like to also give that thanks for the Jump Arches program. I know OSF has joined us today as well. It's Thank been a you. nice relationship between the College of Engineering and OSF and the Jump Simulation Center over in Peoria. And they funded a lot of projects related to COVID. It was a competitive process. So congratulations for being selected in that process. Thank you. So mitigations, you talked about different types, and that is the buzz of today because mitigations are coming. Are there certain ones that your research showed have been more effective than others? I don't know if you got into that granularity. There's a lot of discussion about schools versus restaurants, bars, other types of things uh, of how do you analyze that, that type of efficacy? Well, we didn't specifically look at um, different types of mitigations. The reason for that was because different places are observing different kinds of mitigations. Uh, but of course, depending on the efficiency, we can tell that some places have been more efficient compared to others. The other thing is that it also depends on how many people are testing. For example, on our campus, we are requiring students to like test a lot, while uh, it's not the case like in cities and like places like that. So um, I would say it differs a lot between places. And um, yeah, so um, the, the other thing is that mitigation measures also like are um, like, we cannot say that, okay, you know, we are just doing social distancing because we are doing a lot of things. We did lockdowns, we did social distancing. We, are, uh, we, we, we made masks mandatory in grocery stores and um, even like in universities. And as you said, like schools are being closed. Yeah, so there are lots of factors. But the interesting thing is that our analysis was able to overall capture that. Great.
So we just had a poll and you'll see people saying where they get their information. It didn't have right. uh, Dr. Basu's research yet, but uh, in the future, maybe you'll surpass Johns Hopkins. There you go. Um, tell us a little bit more. So you're a PhD student at the university and this was the type of research that you've been working on this year. In our last couple of minutes, what led you to Illinois? Um, tell us about your experience being in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois. Sure, so I joined the university in 2018. I was really impressed by uh, the, the, me the, the, the intersection between machine learning and like medical science is specifically like the diseases that, that a lot of groups here have been looking at. And um, so I started off by, uh, I've always been fascinated by machine learning and uh, specifically I've been working towards how machine learning can be applied for societal applications. Uh, so in the past, I have looked at other diseases, um, other sorts of disease models. And um, this was of course like COVID-19 in particular for my master's thesis this year, um, I, I looked at COVID-19. Uh, and this was a really interesting project. Of course, um, as I said, I was advised by Professor Campbell on this. So he does a lot of work, a lot of fantastic work on, um, on machine learning models for, um, like, uh, for studying diseases. And um, so that sort of led me into this. And um, I'm, I'm also very glad that I got accepted into the PhD program in computer science this year. And I would love to continue my quest um, in um, studying other diseases as well, not just uh, like pandemics, but um, unfortunately disease uh, is and will always unfortunately be a part of our lives. I think um, that's what the pandemic has shown us, like something as small as a virus could like disrupt our lives to such an extent. So yeah, that's the focus of my research. Thank you again for your time and for Thank sharing you. your research with us today.